Thank you for coming to this session. I'm very excited to be here at um, Lisa 19 to tell you about Kubernetes CI CD, not ACDC, and some GitOps tools, uh, some GitOps, and the GitOps tools are available in open source, and some security considerations related to them. So a little bit about myself, I work at Rakuten. I, I'm a manager of infrastructure there, and we run Kubernetes in production, uh, and I've been a Kata Containers contributor for the last two years, open source and Kata Containers contributor. Uh, some of what we do at Rakuten with Kubernetes and CI CD, we pretty much have that everywhere. Uh, running Kubernetes in production for, for about a year, and our main CI CD system is uh, Jenkins, just basic Jenkins. We're using some cloud native foundation tools as well, like Terra, um, Flux and Helm. And to deploy our infrastructure, we're using Terraform. And there's still some big data and database applications that we haven't containerized yet. And this is a common case in most of the companies that I've talked to and most of the people doing CI CD. Uh, a little bit of what um, I'll be talking about today, briefly touching on the history of CI CD, then I'll talk about why you want to have something like GitOps, uh, and then I'll talk about the tools and security uh, considerations related to them. And I divided these into different categories. You have the developer types of tools like Flux and Draft. Then there's the container image building tools like BuildKit, um, Basil, and Build in uh, Kaneko, and then there's the templating tools. Uh, the more popular one is Helm, and then Customize. Then I'll talk about uh, security tools, and spe specifically like uh, Trivi, container, container image scanning, and Notary, and the update framework. Then I'll talk about how you can put it all together uh, using some CI CD tools like uh, Tekton and Jenkins X. Then I'll briefly talk about the future of GitOps and CI CD. Then I'll finally give you some takeaways. So, some of the history of CI CD in 2003, Billbot was the first CI tool that I've heard about, um, still available today. Some people are using it, uh, but it's pretty bare bones. And in 2011, Jenkins released its first version, and that's when a lot of people started talking about CI deployed to automatically and, and, and run these automatic workloads. And then in 2013, some cloud providers started with their SaaS services of CI CD, and some examples of these are like um, Circle CI and AppVayer. Then in, Kuber in 2015, Kubernetes released its first version, and that's when a lot of people started talking about oh, uh, automatically deploy containers into different environments, into production, uh, and orchest orchestrate your whole workloads. And in 2017, GitOps was, was coined as a phrase by uh, uh, WeBWorks, uh, so a company behind a, a lot of open source projects. So why do you want to have GitOps? I came up with these three reasons, but uh, other people might have different ones. But basically, people want to have a tool that shows a current state, and then it shows a desired state. And not only allowing you to just modify something in that, uh, to show you that, but also allowing you to modify something and then converge into a desired state. And then also they want to be able to track things. So that's why version control. They want to uh, know when something did something or changed something, when somebody changed something, when um, maybe something happened and exactly what line you changed, all these different things that you can do with Git. Uh, and they, they also want to be able to automate uh, uh, their deployments. And, 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 and that helps them with the uh, visibility of uh, where things um, you know, happen in the infrastructure. And then if they want to revert, also allowing them to do that. And then have that transparency across an organization. So this is typically what a GitOps infrastructure looks like. So you have the developers and the cluster operators, and the developers committing code to co code repositories and kicking off a bill, and then that bill building an artifact, like a container image, pushing it over to a, a container registry, and then having something maybe automatically on, say, your Kubernetes clusters that identify 
uh, the, uh, those changes and then automatically deploy it to the different environments. At the same time, cluster operators can also modify configuration repos and then have some tool also identify that. And then all of these different uh, people in the organization being able to, to connect to different environments like production, development, et cetera. So why do you care about security also with, with GitOps and, and CI/CD? So basically, when you look at the same diagram, you see that there's many points in between where an attacker can come in and compromise your infrastructure, right? So when somebody's committing code to the repos, when somebody's pushing over to a container registry, and also when you're pushing over to a Kubernetes cluster, or when people are looking, looking, at, thing, looking at things in, in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and also, GitOps itself has a lot of vulnerabilities. And some examples of these are like you know, glibc. So if you're running um, a Linux container, uh, you most likely are running glibc because it's you know, what a lot of workloads use. Uh, so if you have a vulnerability there, you might be compromised. Then there's also container backdoors. So run C is the most popular runtime. Basically, if you're using Docker, you're using run C. So if you have a vulnerability there, you might be, you, you, you might be in trouble. Then there's also uh, typo squatting, say like you download an artifact from somewhere in the cloud, but it doesn't happen to be the legitimate source, so you download something locally and then you can cause a lot of damage. There's also Kubernetes type of vulnerabilities, and most of them allow you to do some privileged type of escalation where you can you know, do deployments, create config maps, uh, create secrets, all these different things in a Kubernetes cluster. And of course, there's the uh, vulnerabilities from all these CI CD type of tools. So first, let's talk about developer tools and some security considerations related to them. Okay, so Draft is a tool by Microsoft open source, and it allows you to do this application deployment and um, development locally so developers can, can use its command line, uh, for example, draft up, draft create, all these different things, and they can create and package up their application and then deploy it either to a Kubernetes cluster remotely or locally, say, if you're running uh, a Minikube or one of those local Kubernetes clusters. Draft supports ma many languages, and that's kind of nice. Uh, so it allows all these developers to have flexibility, right? So you're not tied down to just uh, Ruby, Rust, or Go. I, I mean, you, you, can, you have all these different choices. Uh, but one thing about supporting all these different languages is that every language is the runtime, right? So every runtime could have a vulnerability. So you might be exposed there. So it's a nice to have, but in terms of security, you might be compromised. So looking at the pros and cons of Draft, uh, so it allows you to have that local development. Uh, it uses a Git author authorization authentication model, which, which is well proven. Then it has its own uh, image builder, so you can say there's less uh, tampering or possibility for somebody not to tamper with your uh, builds. And then the community is very active, so if you have any problems, it's very likely that you'll get a fast response. Then, in terms of cons, uh, we talked about the many languages. Uh, it could be security problem. Of course, there's more flexibility, but there's trade-offs. Uh, so if you're using uh, uh, Helm v2, that, then you require, it, it, I mean, this tool requires Helm, but if you're using v2, uh, you might be vulnerable because you're going across uh, the network to connect to, to this component called Taylor. And it's a point 0.16 release, so it's kind of experimental. And there's no native RBAC support yet. So another tool is Flux. Um, it's by Weakworks, and it allows you to do application deployment. So developers can de develop the code just the way they do it. And then once they uh, want to commit something, they just do a git push. And that automatically kicks off a workflow uh, that maybe uh, if you have a Flux controller in a Kubernetes cluster, it will sync up and, and create a deployment. It, allow, it also allows this deployment remotely using this uh, Flux CTL command line. So looking at the pros and cons, it has its own CRD, uh, so it's more Kubernetes native. Uh, it uses also Git authentication, authorization. Then it's a pretty mature release, so WeBWorks are the folks that started GitOps. 
So it's 115, the community is also very active. And looking at some of the consoles, uh, there's not uh, RBAC natively uh, supported in uh, some of the container images uh, may need to be signed and, and it's not directly support, supported by Flux. And then because you're syncing all these different things, you might be exposed to man in the middle type of attacks. Uh, and there's no local development uh, support, it's just plain Git. So looking at the diagram of uh, Flux uh, or the two different workflows with Flux, you have either the developer or the cluster operator in terms of uh, the developer, uh, he or she would do a commit and then that uh, will, will kick off a bill, and then uh, eventually you push it over, push over a, a registry to, to Docker, a Docker pub or Docker registry, and then and the Weave controller automatically will de deploy to a Kubernetes cluster. And then the, the other workflow is a cluster operator where uh, the, cl uh, the cluster operator uh, modifies the con uh, a configuration repo that contains, say, like, a, like an image tag, and that tag uh, change is automatically uh, identified by the weak flux controller and deployed to a Kubernetes cluster. But then what we talked about before, right? So you have all these different points uh, where you're syncing, where, where you're pushing, so you might be exposed to an attacker. So other GitOps developer tools, there's many of them. I'm not going to talk about them, so if you have any questions about them, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Another notable one is Scaffold. Um, uh, it's by Google Cloud, and it's kind of similar to, to Draft. So what kind of help can we get uh, from, from other tools and uh, to improve security also for, for these developer tools and to improve CI/CD uh, over, overall? So first, let's talk about image uh, building tools, like container image building. So f first, Canico is a tool by Google Cloud. Uh, it allows you to just build co uh, container images in a Kubernetes cluster. It has a nice support that allows you to build uh, local file uh, using the local file system, or it supports also Google Cloud Storage or Amazon S3. And it does it using this Canico executor image. This is basically a Go executable inside a container that is signed and verified. And then it builds under a context and then and it uses unnested containers to improve performance. If you want to add that extra security with something like Canico, you can use Kubernetes native mechanisms like pod security policies or network uh, policies, which is a firewall in Kubernetes. Or you can use something, if, if you're using Docker, you can use something like SecCom, uh, a SecCom profile with App Arbor. But this is kind of tricky because you have to uh, custom make it for every workload if you, if you want more security. And then if you, if you want something easier, you can use Gvisor or Kata containers, so some of the new runtimes. Uh, BuildKit is another tool for building container images. It builds OCI images. OCI is the Open Container Initiative Standard. Uh, it supports either its own build packs or Docker files. It does require a daemon, and it has a nice thing that uh, you can use um, either container D or run C backends. So if you're using container D, you can use something like uh, another uh, uh, popular runtime or a different runtime. And it does have a support for uh, its own CLI to, to make it possible to build images. And another Interesting fact about uh, can, um, BuildKit is that it, it, some other tools are, are built on top of it, like IMG. And in terms of security, uh, it supports unprivileged uh, building container images, so you don't need access to your slash proc directory. Um, so those are critical components on your Linux system, for example. And then it also supports Linux names, user namespaces, so you can do rootless builds in uh, containers, so you don't need root inside the container. And then it has this other nice feature uh, to clone Git repos using SSH. Basil is another tool, or Basil. Uh, this is a general purpose build tool, uh, not just container build tool, uh, by Google. And Interesting thing, Kubernetes is actually built with Basil. So all the different components like the Kube API server, the Kube controller manager, the Kubelet, everything that you see in Kubernetes is built with Basil. But Basil also has a module to build containers. 
Ironically, it's called Docker rules because uh, it's, it's just to build containers, but you don't require Docker to, uh, to build uh, containers with Bazel. You can also use uh, Knative, to, Knative to build it with uh, serverl uh, serverless uh, uh, templates, right? So, and, and then in terms of security, uh, you can uh, build the containers in an unprivileged way. And then uh, one of the things about Basel is that your builds are always deterministic and reproducible. Uh, so you always know what you get. And it uses this caching mechanism where uh, your builds are incremental. So you, they're also pretty fast. So other build tools, not going to talk about all of them. But then there's KPAC recently announced by VMware. Uh, works with build packs. It's another cloud native foundation project. Then there's Builda from Red Hat, and they support also rootless containers. So feel free to ask me any other questions about these. So another set of tools is the templating tools. And what's the most popular templating tool in Kubernetes? That's Helm, basically. So it allows you to deploy uh, templates to Kubernetes clusters. Keep in mind that this is just not a templating tool. It's also a deployment tool. Right? So Version three is going to have uh, more uh, capabilities, so it has this nice way to extend it or, or add plugins using Lua. Uh, and V2 uh, Tiller is going to go on a, going away with, with V2, version three, and then it doesn't have any specific security mechanism. It it just uh, uses some of the other existing uh, things like SSL, and you can tie it with other CI, uh, CD uh, security tools that I'll talk about in a little bit. Customize is another uh, framework for templating or, or, or a tool for temp templating. Uh, and this tool allows you to change your Kubernetes, YAML, or manifest files on, on the fly, so it, it, you don't have to modify it. Uh, so it does it using um, Customize that YAML configuration file, and it's part of the kubectl source code tree. So, uh, so some of the newer enhancements in kubectl are supported there. So you need kubectl 1.14 above, above, and it has this nice uh, way of creating secrets on the fly. So it's you know you don't have to hard code your secrets in your YAML files if you don't want to. So let's talk about. Uh, specifically about security tools. So, so Tough and Notary, there's another tool called Graphius that is very similar to this. So in essence, this is by Moby and Docker, and basically it, it allows you to sign metadata. Tough is, stands for the update framework, and that's the standard. And Notary um, is the implementation of that. Right? So, and it has this nice thing to provide delegation, you have this master uh, children, and each one of them can, can do different kinds of things depending on how you want to configure that, uh, your authentication, your, your, your signature model. Uh, and its architecture is client and server, uh, and it, the server is basically a CIDR service, and it has this ni nice way to allow publishers to sign content offline. Uh, so you don't have to go across the network to, to do the, your operations. So Trivia is another tool, and that's uh, a different kind of tool. It's a container image scanning tool, uh, specifically Trivia is by Aqua. And one of the nice things about these tools is that they allow you to audit your applications inside your containers. Uh, and at the same time, you can provide some enforcement of what container images you really want to deploy into your infrastructure in whatever environment you're deploying to. Trivi has its own CLI. You can add it on to any CI CD tool. And then you can either scan it locally with your Docker daemon, or you can also uh, package your, your container image as a tar file and give it to the Trivi command line. So in total, it's another tool from the Cloud Native Foundation. Uh, it's by IBM Open Source. It's, it's kind of like this interesting tool that allows you to ver um, verify every single step of your CI/CD pipeline. So if you have um, 
build step, you have a test uh, step, then you have a push step, and then you have a deploy step. All these different steps you want to verify, and then if one of them actually, for some reason, gets tampered with, you will be able to detect it with a tool like Intoto. Right? So it, it uses basic asymmetric cryptography, so public-private key, uh, and yeah, it can be added to any type of tool. You can create these links between the different steps. Say if the build step is, gets tampered with, then your build doesn't continue, right? Your, your CI CD pipeline stops there. So other security tools, many, many of them. Um, won't talk about them. There's different categories. There have, you have the signing tool, you have the image scanning tools, uh, you have some for Kubernetes admission controller, you have image encryption, so many of them. So how can you put all of this together? How do, uh, put, how do you put like image scanning and then um, you, uh, some of the, the, the other tools that I talked about before uh, together, so to create like a, like a pipeline. So first, uh, then you, you have Jenkins X, which is now part of the continuous or uh, continuous deployment foundation, I think it's part of the Linux foundation. Uh, so it's based on Jenkins, uh, the original Jenkins, but it's a lot more complex because it has other components related to Kubernetes. For example, it has uh, a Helm repository, has a way to discover these Helm charts. Um, it also uses some of the tools that I talked about before, like Draft and Scaffold. So Draft is used to manage the source code, and then Scaffold is used to, um, to build and push container images. In terms of security, it has this uh, nice feature that it allows you to auto-upgrade the, the tool using GitOps and Tecton. Tecton is another uh, tool that I'll talk about in, in, the, in the next slide. And then for security, it, and on, it, it uses that Jenkins existing security mechanisms like um, the integration with LDAP uh, or OpenID or all those different um, ID providers. So Tecton, uh, what is it? So it's uh, native pipelines in Kubernetes, right? So uh, using its own custom resource definitions, CRDs. Uh, it's based on Kubernetes jobs, so it basically follows the same type of uh, uh, workflow where when you create a pod, uh, it, a pod gets started and then a, a, a pod uh, then turns into a running state and then from a running state it goes to, in, into a completed state. Uh, so it's very similar to how jobs work in Kubernetes, right? So, and it has this re custom resource definitions called tasks, pipelines, and resources. And the resources are very specific to uh, CI, CD type of workloads. So like container images or Git repositories. And so in essence, in, you will have a pipeline and in every pipeline you will, you will have many tasks and inside this, those tasks, you will have all these resources related to CI, CD. For security, you just use the Kubernetes native type of uh, uh, mechanisms that are available, like pod security policies. Then you can use, uh, uh, to, to clone a repo, you can do it over SSL. And you can use the Kubernetes far, firewall, like network uh, security policies. Other CI CD tools, I don't think I have time to talk about all of these, so, so there's many of them. So the idea is that you can put all of this uh, together with any of these tools, right? So another popular one is Spinnaker. Um, it's a complex tool that also has a, a lot of different components. One of the nice things about Spinnaker is that it allows you to do these um, canary deployments, so it has a way to divide your deployments. It also has a mechanism to build your cloud images it has, this, it has its own way of interacting with different cloud providers like, like uh, AWS, Google Cloud, or Azure. So yeah, so Argo CD and Drone are also more Kubernetes native, but you, know, so you can put together your pipelines using any one of these tools. So what does a secure software supply chain look like? Um, so out of the Jenkins X documentation, I found this diagram. So basically, initially you have your developers, you know, create some code and then uh, make their changes and then push it over to a Git repository and then create a PR. 
and then once they create a PR, you know, have a, a process being uh, kicked off. You have a bill, a test, a package, and then you publish that to a Helm chart repository, and then you deploy it to a preview environment. While that's there, then you have other, people's, other people in your organization uh, doing code reviews, checking the preview environment, making sure everything is okay, and then once they give it a go or give it a LGTM, either you or, or the developer or whoever merges the PR, and that actually kicks off another process, very similar to the first one where you created the PR, where you do a build, test, package, release, et cetera. And then at the end, you deploy it to a staging environment in a Kubernetes cluster. And from there, other people in your organization will jump in. For example, QA folks, they will just run like Selenium tests, we'll check the UI, uh, a different set of tests, right? More, more black box type of tests. And that, when that's complete, then uh, you either manually push a button or you have a mechanism where automatically you say push to production, right? So then you have, and then this could be also a canary deployment or however you want to set it up. But yeah, so you want to add that extra security there, right? So, um, and the first step when you create your merge uh, or your PR, you want to verify every single step of those, right? With something like in total, you verify your build, test, and package. If something happens there, you would know, like some, something uh, is tampered with. Also, you can you scan your container images there. Right? So in, also, when you deploy it to your Kubernetes cluster, you have some uh, little bird there that's Critis. It's another open source project that allows you to change your admission to your Kubernetes cluster. So it's an admission controller manager, right? So you don't want to run your workloads as a um, uh, root user, right? You only want to allow certain kinds of permissions to your file system. You don't want to have a 777 on your file system. So yeah, so you deploy to all the different environments the same way, uh, you verify with something like in total across all these different steps. And also, you can use maybe a more secure container registry, right, where uh, something gets verified there, or you can also um, scan your images there, right? So I, I, there's a project called Harbor from the Cloud Native Foundation, which is a secure re registry that actually uses Notary. So what does it look like in terms of the future for all these GitOps tools and CI CD? So maybe we'll see more self-updates for these tools like Draft and Flux. So not allowing developers to use the tool if it has some vulnerabilities, if it hasn't been patched up. So okay, you don't, you don't have the most up-to-date draft, so you need to update it right away or have something that automatically updates it. There may be more container runtime support for some the New York container runtimes, right, for image building, like Kata Containers or Gvisor, or also GitOps with uh, this new tool from Webworks called Ignite that allows you to use VMs in uh, GitOps type of workflows. Uh, and w there's a lot of talk in the community about these new configuration languages, right? So some people say, okay, YAML is not that great, you know, it's kind of confusing, you know, all the indentation. So there are some new configuration languages like Q and DAO. Um, some of these configuration languages actually allow you to embed code into the configuration. It's yet to be seen whether this is gonna be a major trend, uh, but, um, but this is the talk in the community that maybe YAML is not the, the best. So integration with OPA, Open Policy Agent, another uh, project from the Cloud Native Foundation, there's another project called Gatekeeper that specifically implements open, open policy agent for Kubernetes. Uh, so OPA has this unique language, so Gatekeeper makes that easier you know, by, by implementing that language just for Kubernetes. And it allows you to keep the configurations in a more, in a more uniform way. Then also, a lot of people talk about um, cluster upgrades. Uh, so one of the things with Kubernetes is that they change their APIs from release to release. So they change it from 
uh, like say 114 to 115, they, they change the way the, the deployment definition is defined, right? So instead of V1, it's V2. And then they deprecate a lot of these APIs, right? So uh, if you run, run your cluster upgrade in place, you run the risk of your workloads not even starting again, right? So, so what, are a lot of, uh, what are people doing? They're, they're doing blue and green cluster deployments. So you can use GitOps tools and CI CD also for, for managing your clusters. Uh, and finally, more integrations and integrations with other different kinds of tools. You know, uh, there's a lot of talk about um, chaos engineering and supporting some of those tools, so maybe we'll see some of that as well. So what can you get out of all of this? Um, so first, I think people think about uh, separating their, their environments as a, as a given, but you know, I just want to emphasize that that's really important, right? So you, you want to be able to um, separate w what you're doing with all these different teams in your organization so you know, that your developers don't mess up your production environment. Uh, you have a place in staging for your QA teams to see what's going on. Uh, and then, so without interfering with each other, right? So the idea is just not to create these silos, but then the idea is just to kind of um, allow people to, to not actually step on each other's toes. And also, you want to think about security first all the time. So a lot of people, when they build these pipelines, they, they just start from these tools, and then, lo and behold, they have this huge uh, pipeline, and then, once they want to implement security and they look at it and they go, oh, this is so big, we just need to rip it all out and just start from the beginning, right? So, so think about security first most of the times. Um, uh, it's, so if you don't want to start from the beginning again. Uh, run C is your runtime or very likely. So if you're using Docker, you're using run C. So make sure you patch that uh, regularly uh, in if you want to add that extra security, use something like SecCom profiles. Uh, those are kind of hard, but, uh, but maybe get somebody to, to, to create these, right, if you, think of, if you really care about security. So if, some, if you want something easier, uh, I mentioned before, you can use something like Kata or Gvisor. Uh, and also, you want to check for compatibilities for Gvisor. Gvisor is not or doesn't support all the workloads. Uh, so Gvisor is basically a user level <coughs> kernel uh, and it doesn't actually allow all the system calls to pass through. So some, not, some of the workloads may not be compatible with that. Or, or you can use Kata containers w which would support all your workloads but then check for performance uh, uh, penalties there because Kata containers is a container inside a VM. And now when you build your container images, also uh, use um, uh, unprivileged mode, right? So always use that. Like, uh, don't allow access to your slash proc directory. If you want to add that extra security, make use of user namespaces with rootless containers. There's tools like BuildKit and uh, Belda. And then uh, if you want to add more um, uh, automatic upgrades, you can, use, you can use some of the existing tools to also um, auto-upgrade your GitOps tools. So use GitOps to auto-upgrade your GitOps tools. So you upgrade all those packages using the same process. Leverage something like Intoto. Intoto, you know, you want, it's a great tool to ver verify every single step of your pipeline. So something happened in terms of security, you know, you want to find out if something happens there. Uh, most people don't expose a lot of this stuff to the outside world, but you still want to use it for verification in case something gets tampered. You never know. Um, scan your container images. A lot of open source tools available. Um, you have uh, Anchor, Trivi, Dagda. There's a few vendors as well. So, yeah, so that's... That's critical, so it provides that policy enforcement and also some audit trail of what's in your containers. Use Kubernetes mechanisms for uh, making sure that you're running things as a given user or, or you have the right permissions on the file system. 
couple of tools, um, Critis and Portieris. Always use uh, authentication in Kubernetes with RBAC. Uh, and also the policy, the network policies in, in uh, Kubernetes, is, which is the Kubernetes firewall, right? So what IP addresses are, are you going to allow? Uh, yeah, make sure that it's only maybe internal IP addresses, or if you, if you poke a hole there, make sure it's just, just a specific IP address that you know which one it is. Uh, there are some tools that allow you to help, uh, to help you with, with configuring network policy. Uh, one of them is Trireme, and typically the network overlays to in Kubernetes allow you to um, configure network policies. Yeah, with that, so here are some resources, and yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you. We will give a round of applause. We have some time for some questions. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, the microphone is right in the middle of the uh, room. I walk up to it, ask your question. It'll be captured by the camera, and uh, we will hear it in the video later. No pressure, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's uh, Paul Krizak from Qualcomm. Uh, what you've shown here in this talk is exactly what I think a lot of us in Kubernetes container space are feeling right now, which is overload. There's just so much out there because the industry is moving so fast. As a result, at least we tend to have developers that are, they, everyone seems to have a niche where a particular product is really good at it, and so they want to go off in that direction. Then another team might do something else that's a little different, so some other tool manages to meet that, that demand, and so they go off in the other direction. So as an IT organization, how do we wade through all of this? I mean, because ultimately, we'd love to find a tool that meets 80 90% of everyone's needs, but there's just, it's almost like just throwing a dart at the wall that we're going to find anything that's actually going to do that. Is there, are any of these companies going to be around in five years? Yeah, I mean... Uh, Kubernetes is now very simple. I mean, I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, so yeah, so your question is about, you know, how do you, how do you make it easier to pick maybe a tool that handles more of the things so that uh, you don't have to go out and try all these different things and uh, maybe end up with something like you didn't want to, right? So um, I say focus on the more of the different areas of uh, what you want to do, right? So in terms of security, you know, I, sh I show like, you, you, do you want to have something like where you verify your, every step of your pipeline, or you want something that scans your container images, or something that, um, yeah, man uh, does something with your, your network policies, right? So uh, obviously you want something 100% secure, which most of most of the people don't have, right? So, but uh, uh, you want to use all of them or, or, or a type, but maybe focus on one of these areas that, that is more important to your organization, right? And then uh, pick a tool from one of these areas and hopefully like an open source tool that has a lot of traction and is supported by a major organization, right? Don't, don't pick like a tool that, that is not backed by, uh, uh, when talking about open source tools, that is not backed by, by, by a, a large, uh, or entity, right, like uh, Microsoft or Google or something like that, right? So, so eventually, you know, you'll, you'll have that support, right? Uh, um, that's not a given because sometimes, you know, you, you see Microsoft or, or Google trash an open source project, right? So, uh, and I think you, it's important that you work with the community of that open source project to make it more successful too, right? So if you pick that open source project to, uh, you know, show that you invested in that project and then that, that you're gonna make it more successful down the road, right? Not in terms of just money, but also in terms of people and time, right? So, and, and then also, when I think about open source, it's, it's just not about all, uh, uh, you know, just writing code. It's, it's also about organizing the open source project, you know, making it like, uh, uh, you organize this, the meetings, you, 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 you move it forward, you see the, the things that are missing, right? Or, yeah, so participate more in the community if you're, if you're invested there. Does that actually make sense or do you, yeah? Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. 
Any other questions? All right, let's give a round of applause for our speaker.